May I speak with the manager? This was a question a customer posed to me when I worked at Ryan's Family Steakhouse, where the folks are friendly. And yes, we had to answer the phone that way when people still answered phones. The customer in, in this story, I don't even really remember what her problem was, but she had a problem and she wanted it resolved. She wanted it fixed. And apparently I didn't have the authority to fix it. So she wanted the guy above me. She wanted the manager. She figured if I couldn't or wouldn't fix the problem, she'd need to move up the food chain, move up the organizational chart, the hierarchy to get to the person in charge. She didn't want the frontline worker who was really still in high school and had no authority. She just could get you a drink and take your order. So she wanted the manager and she may have even had to move up the line a little bit more to the general manager. And often when we encounter, you know, an organization, a structure, um, there are many levels that we have to go through to get to somebody who can actually make a decision, who can actually fix a problem, you know, that person in charge. And the thing is that in our faith, that idea is flipped on its head. And Jesus today with his disciples in our passage is telling them that this organizational structure, this org chart, this hierarchy of sorts has been thrown out the window and that we now have direct access to the CEO, the person in charge. We have direct access to God the Father. And I'm so excited for us to delve into that today. Welcome to Church in the Mall Online. Um, I'm so excited that you're with us today. Please uh, let us know that you're with us by dropping a hello in the comments. Um, and if you're new, please fill out our digital connect card at churchinthemall.com slash welcome. And I have some exciting news, friends. We are resuming in-person worship on Easter. Easter this year is on April 4th, and we are getting ready to reopen the building. Um, we haven't closed the church, but we will be reopening the building. Um, and we have two in-person opportunities for you to worship with us on Easter. And one will be in our parking lot at 8.45 a.m. So it will be outdoors. Um, you're welcome to bring camp chairs. Um, we'll, of course, have some folding chairs for um, those of you who don't want to sit in a camp chair. Um, and another Easter service will be at 10.45 a.m. inside the building with masks and social distancing, of course. And additionally, we'll have an online opportunity at 10.45 a.m. Um, so there are three opportunities for worship on Easter. 8.45 a.m. outdoors, 10.45 a.m. indoors, as well as a 10.45 a.m. online. And friends, we need your help. We need folks willing to help us get the church ready for in-person worship. We need hosts, we need cleaners, we need folks willing to help move tables and chairs, as well as help sanitize the place. Let us know. Let us know that you're excited to help us celebrate the resurrection, as well as resume in-person worship um, by signing up to help. There's a sign up at churchinthemall.com slash welcome. And you'll also find other things at that hub um, online as well. In particular, um, there's an opportunity to give online or to even um, look up our address to mail in your financial gifts um, at churchinthemall.com slash welcome. So be sure to check that out. And now let us turn our attention to God's word in John's, um, in John's gospel. Welcome to Church in the Mall Online. Hello. Today's reading comes from John chapter 16, verses 16 through 33. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father? They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more? and then after a while you will see me? I tell you the truth, 
You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman given birth to a child has pains because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus answered, but a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This ends today's reading. We are Easter people, living in a Good Friday world. This is the reality that Christ created with his death and resurrection. And 2,000 years ago, in preparing his disciples for this new reality, Jesus talked a lot, and particularly talked in pictures, you know, really imaginative language to describe what this new world would be like. In our passage today, Jesus uses this image of birth. He talks about how God's new world will be born out of the womb of the old. Jesus uses the imagery of giving birth to express what's going to happen. And he invites his followers to prepare themselves for sorrow and then a lasting joy. So first comes the sorrow, the pain, and then joy. And this is modeled on the sorrow and the joy of a woman going into labor. Now, I had the double bonus of being induced and experiencing labor pains for more than 20 hours. The problem was my not so little dude didn't want to leave the happy home I had made for him. He didn't understand that there was this whole new world on the outside waiting for him. It was full of people who were so eager to love him. He just didn't get it. So my doctor had to go in and get him, mostly for my safety. And it took my body weeks to heal from that surgery. But there was, and there still is, great joy in that little guy. And that's much like the picture that Jesus paints of the world that he is bringing into reality, that he's ushering in. There will be days and weeks of pain to come as the body recovers from its ordeal. But new life has come, and with it, new joy. Jesus' disciples, at this point in John's Gospel, they're about to be plunged into a very short, but sharply, intensely painful period that will be like that moment of birth. Jesus will be taken away, but they will see him again. His death and resurrection are the necessary events that will lead to his going to the Father and his sending of the Spirit. The disciples can hardly really prepare for this. And we look back on it from this side of the cross, but 
We have to remember they had no concept of this. And this is why Jesus is using imaginative language to describe what's to happen. He's trying to warn them, trying the best that is possible to prepare them for what is going to come that is completely unimaginable. And this isn't just simply a matter of Jesus saying, well, there's trouble coming, but it'll be all right afterwards. No, it's, it's a matter of seeing that when we find ourselves, you know, a couple chapters from now at the foot of the cross, and then when we find ourselves with Mary Magdalene in the Easter garden, that we shouldn't really miss the significance of these events. You see, it's a lot. And for Jesus to prepare the disciples for this, it's, it's almost too much. And we see this even in this dialogue that Jesus has with them in verses 16 to 19, with the disciples, you know, kind of tossing Jesus' words to and fro, kind of back and forth. And it really makes it clear that they don't understand much of it now. And I think we, we may even identify with that at times because we don't always get it. And we know how the story ends. We know the outcome. But that's, that's the beauty of the Spirit. That's the job of the Spirit, the helper, the advocate that Jesus talks about sending to them. That the advocate, this helper, the Spirit of God will lead them to all truth. And with this new world, this new reality, comes this beautiful thing, this direct access to God. This passage here is about the fact that Jesus' people have instant, immediate, direct access into the very presence of the living God. This extraordinary, intimate union, union between Jesus and the Father that he keeps talking about, that is such a main theme in John's Gospel. What that relationship means is that those who belong to Jesus, those branches that belong to the vine, are granted the same immediate access to the Father that Jesus himself has. And what is more, when they pray in Jesus' name, which means as, you know, as we saw, it's not magic words, but when they pray conscious of the fact that they belong to him, when we pray that we are so aware that we belong to Jesus, we are leaning into that relationship. That when we pray in his name in that way, that what we're doing is we're leaning into who Jesus is. We're leaning into his character and we're doing things that bring him glory. Then, then the father welcomes them instantly and gives them whatever they ask for, as it says in verse 23. You see, it's, it's about knowing that we belong to Jesus. And in belonging to Jesus, then our world is oriented around loving God and loving others. And so why wouldn't we ask for things that God wants to grant, that God wants to lean into in our prayer lives? And the beautiful thing is that we have that access. And that when we are people who look at the promises of God, and we take them at face value, that we trust in them, and we're humble enough to believe them, God is completely open to us. And, and sometimes I think we reject this, that we really even, we limit God um, in ways because we're not fully prepared to accept that gracious gift, that we allow our pride to get in the way. You know, we. We really get in our own way too much of the time. And we're sometimes our own worst enemy. You see, when we allow that form of pride to stop us from accepting fully that gracious gift that God offers us, we get in the way of what God can do in and through us. You know, sometimes receiving a gift, receiving a gift this great is overwhelming. And we really can't even comprehend the magnitude of it. And it makes us really uncomfortable. And we start to say things either out loud or, or within ourselves like, I didn't earn this. 
I don't, I don't deserve this. And we feel really awkward and uncomfortable and, and we start to say things like, oh, oh, that's, that's really too much. I, I can't accept it. Just no, no, I can't take it. And we leave it behind. We reject it because we, we rely on this idea that we should deserve what we receive. And the point of grace is we don't get what we deserve. We don't get what we deserve. Instead, we get all that God offers. So when we say yes to God, when we say yes to his gift of grace and salvation, we receive something we didn't earn, but that is worth more than we could ever imagine. So when we take God at his word and we receive that overwhelming love of God, we see the point of this passage. That this whole passage is about the Father, and Jesus continually points us to him, doesn't he? He's always pointing to the Father. He always wants us to see this loving Father and know that in belonging to Jesus, that we have that same Father. So this Father, seeing him, seeing how much he loves each one of us who trust in Jesus and how great the promises that he makes, and that he'll deliver on them in Jesus. He does this for each of us. And at the end of our passage, you know, the disciples are listening to Jesus describe what's coming and in all that Jesus is trying to do to prepare them for not only his death and resurrection, but also life beyond. You know, the life that we live in now. You know, our world still looks a little bit like Good Friday, doesn't it? And it feels like it too. But we are Easter people. We are people who live in the glory and the beauty of the resurrection. And we have this sense now that Jesus is finally speaking as clearly and openly as possible to speak about God the Father and about himself. That yes, these horrible events that up to now he's really just hinted at, and he's also interpreted for us. They're about to engulf him and also his disciples. And when we read through this, we allow ourselves to reimagine that story in our own lives. And we see Jesus the shepherd. Jesus the shepherd will face the foe alone. And he's really not alone. See, what he does on the cross, he does in the presence of the Father. And that somehow, even in the worst that is to come, the disciples can have a peace that will carry them through. That even in the worst of it, we can have the peace of God carrying us through. It's, it's really a matter of standing on the ground that Jesus is, is going to win. That Jesus, on this side of the cross, for us, has one that when we stand there and and live fully in those claims that he has won that there is victory you know you'll have trouble in the world but cheer up i've defeated the world this is what he says to us yes you'll have trouble in the world but but it's going to be okay because i've defeated the world when Jesus took upon himself the weight of the world's sin, when he burst through death itself into God's new creation, and already, already we have seen in this gospel, this, this new reality that Jesus is bringing into, into our world, that when he challenged the power of corruption, when he challenged death and decay, when he healed the cripple, the man born blind, when he healed and raised from the dead Lazarus, we saw this world and we see it every day when we look for it. See, in and through those things, he was not just simply proving a point, 
but winning a victory. So when we stand on that ground that he has won, we realize that instead of a hierarchy, hierarchy, ah, that's a big word, isn't it? So instead of a hierarchy, we have community. That we have community with one another, with those who belong to Jesus. And more importantly, we have communion with God. We have this intimate connection and belonging with God. We have access to God the Father always through Jesus. So as we conclude today, I want to pray a blessing over us from Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.